I hate squid, but that's it. That's like the craziest. Um, I think the greatest life lesson that I learned was definitely that you need to be confident in who you are. Don't second guess yourself all the time. The more you second guess yourself, the more you beat yourself up, the harder life's gonna get. You're never gonna be perfect. You're never gonna be that ultimate missionary. You're never gonna be that perfect person. So stop trying so hard to be that perfect person because it's not gonna happen. Just be yourself. Be the best self that you can be. And that's all you can do. I got a ukulele and I started learning it, but I also definitely think that my confidence in approaching strangers that I had no idea anything about people who like I legitimately could be scared of, like it definitely grew. And I was this like little Utah girl, you know, and never really been around drunk people before. And you go to Scotland and Ireland and you're around drunk people quite frequently. And so I feel like now I understand like how to deal with people who are drunk in a way that is not going to cause harm or bodily harm or anything to anyone around me, which is good. I had a companion, Sister Firth, and we were in the Outer Hebrides. And you get like the leftover hurricanes from the like Caribbean because they come up on that current and it goes straight through the islands. And so you get like lots and lots of really bad weather, especially in the winter months. And uh, there was hail that was like coming down like this at us and the wind's blowing and we'd like walk out of our door and go around the corner so we weren't being sheltered by the building anymore. And we literally had to like bend over and grab onto the wall because the wind was blowing so hard. And we had like bruises all up and down our legs from the house stones. <laughs> it was great. <laughs> I think the hardest experience would have to have been in Stornoway as well. When we first got there, we were opening the area, and so we honestly had nothing. We had a few members that came to church, but it was less than 10. And that's the, also the area where um, the ministers let everybody know about the missionaries who were coming. And so it wasn't very easy to get into doors. So we'd go around and we'd talk to people all the time, and we would try our best, and we would go out and we'd be out proselyting from the times we were supposed to be proselyting. And it just got really hard. And so my companion and I one day were like, hey, this is not working. We've got to figure it out. We've got to figure out why we're here because we're not doing anything. We haven't had an appointment in two weeks that hasn't been a member. Like, it's, it was pretty bad. And so we knelt down and we prayed and we're like, hey, we, we had actually received a commitment um, to do something such as invite someone to baptism and we had no investigators so it's kind of hard to invite someone to baptism if you have no investigators and so we prayed and we were like hey God we've got to find someone someone we can at least teach I mean honestly we know that trying to invite someone to, for baptism is going to be a little bit difficult but that's the assignment our district was given but we are fine with just finding someone to teach anyone. We don't care who it is. And so we went to this little town called Back. And we started knocking on doors and we went to one door. They were like, hey, you should go see my minister. So we went and go see the minister, talked to him for a minute. He tells us we need to do our homework and we need to repent. And we're going to go to hell and all that other fun stuff. And uh, we end up leaving his house and we go and continue knocking on every single door in the village. And it's, it's getting dark. And there's this one house that has lights on. We're like, well, it didn't have any lights on, actually. It was next to a house that had lights on. And it was like this little cabin, and there was like this, it's a caravan or like a fifth wheel in the back. And so my companion and I look at each other, and we're like, all right, well, we have to knock on like at least the, the house door, you know, to figure out what's going on with this place and so we like knock on the door no one comes so we're like okay like not, not a big deal we'll just start walking because we had to catch a bus in just a few minutes and as we're walking away like I just felt really strongly that we needed to go knock on the door 
of the caravan behind his house. This was just like this little trailer. People could live in like a little camp trailer. And it was obviously empty. And I was like, what the heck? Like, why am I feeling this? Like, no. And I kind of fought with it for a second. And then I like turned to my companion. I'm like, hey, we need to go knock on that caravan door. And she's like, what the heck? Are you crazy? No, we don't. And I'm like, yes, we do. <laughs> like, I do not know why. Like, I've already tried to argue this. Like, I'll, I'll go do it. I'll like stick a card through the door. It'll be fine. And so I go and knock on the door. No one comes. And my companion like actually stayed back in the back, but it turned out to be a really good thing that this happened. She stayed back a little ways, kind of by the door of the house. And as I'm like trying to slip the card through, the light goes on in the house behind us. And there's this guy that like opens the door and he's like, Hey, what do you guys want? And it's like this big dude. He's like six, two, six, three. He's completely bald. And I look over there and I'm like, Oh shoot. I'm going to die today. I'm going to die. And my companion starts talking to him and I come over and I'm like, sir, I am really sorry about trying to slip this card through your door. And my companion's like, Hey, like just, just talk to him. And I was like, yeah, what's up? Well, like, what's your name? You know, started getting his information and talking to him. And he was like, you know what? I have been looking for people like you. I've been looking for someone other than Jehovah's Witnesses. I need someone who can teach me about God and who God really is. And I need to know what God's identity is and my relationship with him. And those were like his first words to us. And we're like, wait for real. Like, are you being serious? So he got his number and his information and we came back and he ended up getting baptized December 28th. And it was, it was a remarkable experience. So one time I had to buy a new camera and it was like 50 pounds because my camera got soaking wet. And I was like, shoot, I'm gonna use all my money for souvenirs on a camera. So I can remember like the places and the people, which is way more important, but I was a little bit disappointed. So obviously that night I prayed and I was like, God, you know, I kind of lost my camera and it died and I had to get a new one, but I used all my souvenir money. So, I mean, I know this probably isn't a big deal to you, but I'd at least like to have a Scottish flag and maybe a kilt. And I ended up going about my day, my week, and there was this guy, he was legitimately crazy, but he ended up giving me, my companion, three kilts. There's another guy I met on the bus and I'm talking to him and he's like, hey, you're a missionary from America? And the first question he asks me, he's like, do you have a Scottish flag yet? And I was like, no, but I'm not gonna take your Scottish flag. Cause he just pulls out two Scottish flags out of his backpack and he's like, here you go. I'm like, I'm not gonna take your flag. And he's like, oh, well, do you have something to give me? And I was able to give him a Book of Mormon and trade him a Book of Mormon for like flags, which was kind of a pretty sweet deal. And then when I was in Northern Ireland, during the month of July, that's like their Independence Day. And there was one organization of people, which probably should not be talked about, but they were cutting down flags from a different organization and they were putting them in trash bags to take them and burn them. And of course, me being me, I'm like, hey, like, are you gonna burn those flags? Cause uh, if not, or if you are, like I will totally take a cup off your hands. And I'm from America, so it means nothing to me. So like, I'm not gonna come and like hurt your organization in any way. And they ended up giving me like five flags. So if anybody needs a Scottish or an Irish flag, like I've got the hookups. Um, so one of the most important things for me was learning how to love not only the people. For me, it was easy to love the people I was serving with. And it was also, it was usually pretty easy for me to love my companions, but when you first have a new companion, it's hard to like trust them right away and just be like, all right, we're going to be awesome together. We're going to be like best of friends and da, da 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 But I think some of the most spiritual moments came as soon as I learned how to trust my companions and understand that they really were there to help me and they were there to serve the Lord. They're there for the same reasons you are. And they're there to help people come closer to Christ. And some of those people that need to come closer to Christ are 
not only the members and the less actives and the investigators, but they're also the missionaries. And when you recognize that, like every single moment, every single lesson will turn into an incredibly spiritual moment. And you'll love it. Another area with Sister Hammond. And I don't know if she really remembers this, but like we would go out and we it was our first like week of being together. And both of us are very like type A personalities. Like our job is to get things done. Like red personalities, type A, like whatever you want to call it. And both of us are very competitive. And so we'd see someone on the street and we'd like go up and we'd be like, hey, like we've got to talk to you about this and this and this and this. And it was like a race to get to the person. And one time it had been particularly competitive that day, <laughs> which is fine, I guess, sometimes. But um, we saw this guy walking towards us and she just takes off. And I'm like, oh my gosh, like for real. We cannot make this competition anymore because, like, the spirit is leaving. And she stops this guy. And I just, like, I'm praying that, like, things can work out and that someone will actually listen to us because, obviously, when there's this competitive spirit, this prideful spirit, you're not going to have as much success. And she starts talking to him and she starts asking questions about his life, his family. And it turns out he's an alcoholic. And... He, he needs help. He had just gone through a divorce and he'd really been struggling with his life. And so we're like, hey, yeah, we can help you. So we start teaching him. He wants to get baptized. He wants, he wants things to work out. He wants to get his family back together. He had three beautiful little girls. And he had been drinking since the age of 12. He started trying to come clean and he ended up being hospitalized a few times. And it became un, unsafe for him to continue trying to keep the word of wisdom 100%. And so he needed to go to a rehab center. And we just continued praying for him to like be okay, for things to work out. And things just didn't seem to ever work. And I ended up leaving and going home after a while. And this girl ended up leaving like that transfer too. But right now he's still working with the missionaries. He's still coming clean and he's gone from a lot of alcohol a day. <laughs> like I don't even know how many pints to under nine, which is a huge, huge improvement. And so like it's a very, very gradual thing. And I think that's one thing I've learned with Sister Hammond in our like little comp competition like all the time is that um, sometimes we need to be patient not only with ourselves and like how much pride we have and the struggles that we're working on, but we need to be patient with the people around us, the people that we're working with. Because 95% of the time, those people are trying. They're trying to do better. And we need to believe in them. And we can't give up on them. Even if they're not making progress in the way that we think is necessary, we need to understand what God's plan is for them, and not ours because usually it's different. There was one area that I was working in and we were teaching these people and their work was not really something anybody should ever be doing for work. They were selling drugs and doing them and everything else in the book. So in certain areas, especially like well-off populations, which Aberdeen is one of the wealthiest cities in Europe, and so there's these people who are very, very wealthy and well-off, and there's this, like, sub-level that is not quite as wealthy. And they're very poor. But they still want to have that appearance of wealth. And so they will do whatever it takes to get there. And a lot of times it involves drugs, alcohol, other things that you probably don't really want to talk about. But there are good jobs there as well. There are farmers and ranchers, and those are my favorite people. Um, there's bankers and contractors, just normal jobs like you have here in America. There are a lot of people on welfare, welfare and a lot of people that don't work. Um, I think most of the people that we were teaching at one point didn't have jobs at all. They were all living off of welfare and government money. So not the best situation all the time, but 
hey, if you're a member of the church, like you know how to help people find jobs. And the church has employment resources and we can help people get jobs. So there's this one guy who wasn't working for a while and he actually has been working recently. Like I just talked to him a couple weeks ago and he has a job and he is now fighting for some people, which is fun. Like being paid to fight something like that. Not really sure for story on that, but I should get that. So I understand exactly what's going on with him, but he's, he has a source of income now. That is good. And he got baptized. So that helped a lot too.